Hi, I'm Jeff Gamet. Apple had a lot to announce at their spring loaded media event, so much so that I've got like five, literally five, four. I have literally four pages of notes to get through. So let's hop to it. I'll start with Apple's non-hardware announcements. First up would be Apple Card. The changes there put everyone on the same playing field. That means that everyone that's part of, uh, of an Apple Card account, they get to have their, their shared or merged credit lines, and, uh, and everyone is treated equally. This is great. We live in 2021, not 1950. Good job, Apple. Next up, we have podcasts. Yes, the app has a new interface. Yes, searchability and discoverability should be easier now thanks to smarter recommendations and redesigned channels. The big thing, though, is podcast subscriptions. That means you as a podcaster can now monetize potentially your podcast through Apple's own services. It costs $20 a year to sign up and the first year Apple takes a 30% cut of whatever revenue you generate and 15% after that. That's standard for all of their subscription services. What this means now is that even casual podcasters can do things like create premium content, give uh, give subscribers early access, and and they have a lower barrier of entry into the subscription podcast market. And that brings us to hardware. First announcement was a purple iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 mini. Pro and Pro Max users, sorry, you're out of luck. This is just 12 and 12 mini. And then there's AirTag. It's no longer a rumor. Apple has officially announced their own tracker tag device. It has a U1 chip in it, which means that if you have an iPhone 11 or iPhone 12, that you get precision location tracking, which is great if you're trying to figure out just exactly where in your house your keys or your AirPods happen to be. This thing is eight millimeters thick, so it's a little bit chunky, but um, I think the size is there because it has to fit the electronics and the battery. It has a replaceable battery. That's nice. That means when the battery wears out, you don't throw away your AirTag. You just put a new battery in. Privacy is a big thing for this. If someone puts an AirTag in your gear or you accidentally pick up someone else's bag that has an AirTag, you're going to get an alert. And, uh, and that way you'll know that you have a tag with you that isn't yours. Also, any tracking that's done is done anonymously. Apple doesn't know who you are or who has an iPhone that tagged your location. What do I mean by that? Well, Apple can now take advantage of all of the iPhones in the world to help track your gear if you have an AirTag. That means millions and millions of phones out there have the ability to tell you exactly where your lost stuff is. Also, you can put contact information into your AirTag if you want, and it uses NFC to, uh, to tell someone how to get a hold of you. What that means is that if you have an iPhone or an Android phone, you can just tap an AirTag and it will give you that contact info. That's really cool because that means everyone out there can help get your stuff back to you. I think the AirTag combined with an iPhone 11 or 12 is going to be a really cool thing for people that have any sort of hearing disability. Uh, for example, let's say you can't hear out of one ear, so you don't have stereo hearing. How do you know where the beeping from a tracker tag is coming from? Well, it's hard to tell. With AirTag, the U1 chip that's in the, in the tag and in your iPhone mean you get super precision location tracking. So you'll be able to just dial right in on exactly where your, your lost items are and, uh, and find them very quickly. No extra hunting. AirTags cost $29 a piece or $99 for four. And if you want to actually attach it to something, you're going to have to buy that separately. There's no hole in an AirTag to just pop it onto your keychain. That means that you're going to be spending, assuming you get Apple stuff, the same or more for a, an attachment to the AirTag, then you're actually paying for the tag itself. There are third-party companies already rolling out cheaper solutions. So instead of spending $35 to get a keychain to hold your AirTag, you can spend, say, $13 and get something from Kensington or another company. Next up is Apple TV 4K. Yes, Apple announced a new 
Apple TV model. This one has an A12 Bionic processor fresh from 2018, Wi-Fi 6, HDMI 2.1, Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos, high frame rate, HDR, all the stuff that you would expect to see on a, on a streaming box. Because of the new processor, it should be able to, to play games more robustly. But the thing that I think most people are going to pay attention to is the new remote. The old little black thing with the touch surface that you always held up upside down that everyone seemed to hate is gone. In its place is a new silver aluminum body remote that has a D-pad control on it and the surface around that you can slide your finger on much like an iPod and fast forward and reverse through whatever you're watching. It has a power button so that you can turn on your TV and your Apple TV at the same time plus a Siri button on the side. This is also available as a separate purchase for $59 if you have an Apple TV HD or first generation Apple TV 4K and want to upgrade to Apple's latest remote. Apple TV 4K is priced at $179 for the 32 gig model and $199 for the 64 gig model. Apple TV HD is still available, but it will get the new remote and it's going to cost $149. I'm glad to see Apple finally update the Apple TV. It's only been, what, like about four years? So we're really due. But it would have been nice to see a newer processor put into the uh, into the new model as opposed to something from 2018. Also, it would have been nice to see a lower price point to make this more accessible to a wider range of potential Apple TV Plus customers. Yes, you can get Apple TV Plus as part of uh, a smart television, or at least a lot of them now. But with the box itself, that means that every TV is a potential Apple TV client and not just smart televisions. So it makes sense that Apple is keeping this around. The iMac just joined the M1 family. The new M1 iMac is 11 and a half millimeters thick. That's crazy thin. It's so thin that the headphone jack has to go on the side. It can't go on the back. It has a 4.5K 24-inch Retina display. The base model comes with two Thunderbolt USB 4 ports. The mid and high-end model ship with two Thunderbolt USB 4 ports and two USB 3 ports. The reason we don't see more ports on these models is because it's a limitation of the of the buses on the M1 chip. My expectation is that we will see more ports on new models when they get a newer M series chip. The power cord is now using a magnetic adapter like you would expect to see on say a laptop, but they're not there yet. If you get the the mid and high end models, that power adapter includes an ethernet port built in, gigabit. Otherwise, it's just the power adapter. It has a 1080p front facing camera. It has four, what Apple calls studio quality mics. It has a six speaker sound system, which uh, is supposed to be pretty impressive, but we won't know until these actually ship. Base models all come with 256 gigs of storage, which seems a little low to me for an iMac, but hey, at least it's not 128 anymore. You can get up to two terabytes of storage in these models. They ship with eight gigs of RAM or there's a 16 gig RAM option. The big thing a lot of people are going to notice with these is that now they're available in multiple colors. You can choose from silver or blue, green, and pink at the, at the uh, base model, which is a seven core GPU. Those run $12.99 to start. Or you can add in three more colors, yellow, orange, and purple, if you get the $14.99 or $16.99 eight core GPU models. I really like these colors and I love just how vibrant they are. The problem that I see with them is that the vibrant part is on the back. The front is a pastel color. And I think that you should just have that vibrant color all the way around. If you wanted to go with pastel, put it on the stand. These look like giant iPads, actually. And it's just really cool. They do have that chin, if you will, the chunk across the bottom of the screen where, uh, where it's just computer. And in this case, that's literally just computer. These computers are so thin that the computer is 
itself is in that little strip in the bottom. The whole rest of the thing is the display. These only weigh 9.8 pounds. That's not that much more than my Pismo Power Book back in the day. It's crazy how lightweight these are getting. Uh, the mid and the high end models ship with a Touch ID keyboard. By the way, this keyboard with the Touch ID on it will work with any M1 Mac. So it's going to be available as a separate purchase at some point for anyone else that, that wants to use them with their, with their M1 Macs. For everyone else, the Touch ID button won't do Touch ID. So at that point, it would just be a colored keyboard. And the keyboard is available in colors to match the iMacs. These computers, based on the specs we're seeing so far, are pretty impressive and pretty powerful. If you're looking to get into the M1 product line and you and you really like the iMac form factor, this could be a great way to start. If, however, you want something that has more ports, uh, more storage, more whatever it is that uh, that you need in an iMac, maybe you should wait a little while and see what comes out, especially since there's no 27 inch option for this computer. I think that could be because Apple is holding that back for a newer processor. Maybe that will be the pro iMac, if you will. Uh, it could also be that there were supply constraints and it just wasn't feasible to produce 27 inch iMacs at this time. Regardless, I think these are going to be stupid fast Macs. Apple also unveiled new iPad Pro models with M1 chips, just like in the iMac. This is absolutely bonkers. These come with XDR liquid retina displays. Apple says it has a million to one contrast ratio. That's 1000 nits full screen brightness, 1600 nits HDR at peak brightness. It has a P3 wide color gamut, ProMotion, adaptive 120 hertz refresh rate. It has 10,000 mini LEDs in it for backlighting. For comparison, the previous model had 72, I believe. It also has 2,500 local dimming zones. That means that you can have variable brightness across the entire display. Now for comparison, Apple's $5,000 Pro Display XDR has only 576 dimming zones. What that means is that ultimately, the display in the iPad Pro is better than the display that Apple sells for $5 thousand dollars. It just happens to be smaller. It has a 12 megapixel front facing ultra wide camera. What that means is that now it can take advantage of a brand new feature called center stage, which keeps you centered in the image when you're doing video chats and it can follow you around if you happen to be moving. That's really cool. Also, third party video chat apps can take advantage of this as well. Those apps will need to be updated to use this feature. What I'm hoping this means is that center stage will fix the problem where I'm doing a, a say a FaceTime chat on my iPad Pro and I have to choose between looking unnatural and looking at the screen or looking unnatural and looking at the camera. I wanna be able to look straight ahead and have it look like I'm actually looking straight ahead. There's also a 5G option and that USB-C port that we had on the previous iPad Pro has been upgraded to a Thunderbolt port. That means you can use a wider range of peripherals with this iPad model. You have a faster bus and you can even drive Apple's external display right off of this thing, which is absolutely crazy. 11 inch and 12.9 inch models come standard with eight gigs of RAM in the 128, 256 and 512 gig storage configurations or 16 gigs of RAM in the one terabyte and two terabyte models. Apple Pencil stays the same, so you don't need to, to worry about replacing that. And if you already have a Magic Keyboard, you can still use that. There's a white version available too. Let's talk about what I just dumped out at you, because what I just described sounds to me like a better computer than the iMac that I just told you about. And at this point, I'm looking at these two devices and and I have to, to try and compare them as, are we talking about iMac and iMac mini? Or are we talking about iPad Pro and iPad Pro Max? Or do I look at it as the iMac is the big screen iPad and the iPad Pro is the touchscreen iMac? Because they're 
running the same processor. They have incredible horsepower in each of them. It just looks like one is more portable than the other. And oh, by the way, it has a touchscreen on it. What's the deal here? I mean, is is Apple going to give us a surprise at uh, WWDC and tell us that the iPad is now, or at least the iPad Pro, is now capable of running Mac OS applications, giving us that touchscreen Mac that people have been clamoring for for a long time? Or are they going to keep these as separate things with this, at this point, artificial barrier between the two? I don't know, but I think Apple has something up their sleeve. And when we see what it is, it better be pretty cool and really impressive. And if it's as cool and as, and as impressive as I'm hoping it will be, that means we're reaching the point where I could replace my laptop and my iPad with just an iPad, potentially, and do all the things that I'm doing today. And that would be just absolutely crazy. Wow, we just ran through a lot of information really fast. But don't worry, if you'd like to be able to go through this at a slower pace and more in depth, I've got you covered. My videos for that are coming out very soon. I still have some other thoughts that I want to toss out related to the Apple event. Why are we getting such nebulous release dates? We're talking about pre-orders for many devices starting on the 23rd and then available uh, April 30th. But then we're also getting things like pre-order on April 30th and available sometime in Mar uh, May. So what's up with that? I think the answer is that Apple is dealing with, with the chip constraint, just like the rest of the world, and it's making it much harder for them to nail down the target dates for when products are going to be releasing. We also know that iOS 14.5 and all the related updates are coming out next week. Apple didn't say that specifically, but it showed up in some of the press release information. So we don't have a date, but uh, we do know that we're getting... A uh, all those software updates next week. For me, that's really cool because that means that one of the other features that's in Apple TV, the ability to, to color balance my display using my iPhone is something that I'll be able to do with my iPhone 10 and my Apple TV HD, even though I'm not getting new hardware. So what does that leave for WWDC? I'm betting some pretty big announcements. If we, if we got these new iMacs, just announced, these new iPads just announced. When we get to the pro event, the developer event in June, my guess is that we're going to get announcements that build on what we just saw. Okay, wow, thanks for sticking around. Be sure to check out the videos that I have coming that will dive deeper into all of these products. And uh, thanks for watching. Also, if you want to help out a little bit, I'm available on Patreon and buy me a coffee. I'm Jay Gamut both places. Thanks for watching.